Welcome to the latest episode of Five on the Floor and the Five Reasons Sports Network. Thanks for joining us on your favorite podcast app. We're on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Red Circle. Also on the Five Reasons YouTube channel. Make sure you hit like, subscribe, and turn the notifications on. Also, you can check us out on Off the Floor. That's Winnow with two N's, Winnow.app with two P's. Backslash Off the Floor. Text directly to your phone from Greg, Alex, Brady, and myself. Go to Winnow.app backslash Off the Floor. Free for the first week, $3.05 per month thereafter. Also check out the great sponsors of the five reasons sports network includes our friends over at prize picks. It's an NFL weekend. Get on there now, get on the Hill prop. Waddle is playing again this weekend too. So check that one out. Go to prizepicks.com, the Google play store or the Apple app store. But the key thing is use the code five F I V E. That's our official code and get that initial deposit matched up to a hundred dollars. One thing I do want to make clear here, because people have been asking prize picks is still legal in the state of Florida. Yes. Legal with an L not with an I legal in the state of Florida. You can still play prize picks. You will get your money out. There are no issues there whatsoever. No matter what you may have heard, go to prizepicks.com. Use the code five F I V E. And now today's episode. Yeah. Uh, five on the floor, ride for my dogs. Where is the thing? You can check the score. Hustle hard, couple scars, wearing bubble frogs. Just like what they say, you in trouble, y'all. Kept the floor playing, got an all band. Y'all seen the block, stop the one hand. And pack with trust, it's power, have the guts. We here to bring the heat, y'all can hang it up. Welcome to Five on the Floor, a daily insider show on the Miami Heat and the NBA featuring Ethan Skolnick, Greg Sylvander, and Alex Toledo, plus others from the Five Reasons Sports Network. All right, welcome back to Five on the Floor. Here's today's floor plan. I'm Ethan Skolnick. You can follow me at Ethan J. Skolnick and at Five Reasons Sports. And we've got Greg Sylvander. You can follow him at Greg Sylvander. And I know we've done like 3,000 Damian Lillard podcasts, so we are pivoting today with our first of three podcasts prior to the start of heat training camp, which actually begins in Miami with media day on Monday. And then we'll continue Tuesday up in Boca for the rest of the week up at FAU. They, they are not going overseas or overseas. They're not going to Bahamas this year because you can't leave the country two straight years. So they'll likely do that next year. So they will be in Boca. Um, just programming note here, Alex Toledo, myself, Brady Hawk and Alejandro Vegas will all be at media day. And we've already lined up six sit down interviews. So in addition to everything that's going to be going on at the podium, you can expect to hear from Josh Richardson, Caleb Martin, Jaime Jaquez, uh, Junior, uh, Nikola Jovic, Haywood Highsmith, and Thomas Bryant. We're supposed to get sit downs with all of them. And then, of course, we'll have the podium stuff from Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo, and then wherever it is that Tyler Hero and Ty Lowry speak because they're going to be doing stuff as well. So let's get to a Jimmy Butler related topic here today, Greg. And I posted this after the Dame thing fell through for the heat. And I don't know that we've gotten a poll. It's gotten more votes than this. Uh, This was roughly 5,000 votes. And the question was, has the heat's title window with Jimmy Butler closed? And I can tell you up through about 4,000 votes. This was absolutely 50, 50. It was like, it was neck and neck the entire way. At the end, no, edged out yes. In like the 23rd hour, 51% to 49%. So this would have to go to a recount. Basically, it's a dead split. And it, 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 it indicates sort of where Heat fans are right now, where there's optimism in the Heat because they find a way to get it done, but there's pessimism because it does not appear they're ever going to get that piece that makes it more likely and puts less of a burden on Jimmy Butler. And one of the things that I put out there this week into the atmosphere, and I can tell you that, that some folks close to Jimmy reached out and they agreed with this. I think Heat fans are more frustrated for Jimmy than Jimmy is for Jimmy. That's the sense that I get. Like Jimmy thinks he can take anybody to the finals and that's kind of been proven true. I mean, he's been to the finals two of the last four years and to the conference finals, three or four years. And if he makes one more shot, he would have been in the finals three out of four years. Um, And he's happy with Eric Spolstra and he's happy with the Miami heat. Would he want more help? Of course. Did he ask for Damon Lillard? Yes. But I get a sense. This is more of a heat fan thing 
than it is a Jimmy Butler thing. And I want to start there before you and I debate the question of whether the window is closed, because I have some definite thoughts on that. And I know you and I don't entirely agree on that. But wh- where are you as a Heat fan in terms of, I don't know, feeling sorry for Jimmy, which it feels I, I, that sentiment is out there on Twitter. Oh, feeling sorry goes a little bit too far. Come on, folks. Like we we need to put things in perspective. Shout out to my boy Pat Riley, who once called basketball the toy department of human affairs. We're not going to feel too sorry for anyone, but in the context of this conversation, people, I guess, are tired of watching Jimmy get so tired, dragging guys back to conference finals and finals appearances. And I don't feel sorry for him, but I do understand when you get that close and he's playing at a level that I don't think Heat fans thought he necessarily could get to. Like he can get to the the mountaintop level, but to have just enough to get over that mountaintop, you got to have a couple other guys chip in. Even Dwayne, everyone says 06 was all Dwayne. Now other guys had moments, right? So you need a, a, it's a team effort to win a championship and close. So, yes, I want more help for him. I don't feel sorry for him. But what I will say is that um, in light of the fact that they have gone star chasing over and over again recently and appeared to have then been very much in the mindset of wait for the next star, um, I have some definitive thoughts about how they approach that going forward, particularly because Jimmy Butler has proven, and this is a data-driven decision here, that he may not need a mega star to get this done. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but no, I don't feel sorry for Jimmy Butler. Well, let's look at it this way. Okay. Um, Jimmy Butler has done more with less than pretty much any player in the league over the last four years. And that's not to discredit Bam Adebayo or what Goran Dragic contributed during the bubble run, which was remarkable or what others in terms of the the heat sort of grit and grind type players have done as complementary pieces. But in terms of players with pedigree, he has not had those around him like these other players have had. Um, And you look at the others who have won championships, Giannis, who's now going to get another star playing with him, uh, had a couple of, you know, I would say borderline all-stars in, in Drew Holiday and Middleton. Not superstars, but, but you know, definite B-plus to A-minus type players around him when he won. And he caught a lot of breaks, too, obviously, during that run. Durant hasn't won, even with superstar teammates, since he was with Golden State and he was playing with the ultimate type teammates. Uh, Steph won at, without Durant afterwards in kind of what was a weird year. Um, but he had a lot of help. I mean, he had a former number one overall pick in Andrew Wiggins who played at a very high level. Uh, he, he still, he had clay, even though he was coming back from injury, he had Draymond, uh, that was obviously, you know, a very good team. And Steph had been able to do that before. But if you look at the overall, I mean, look, LeBron won in 2020 against Jimmy, uh, with Anthony Davis next to him, who at his peak level, is a higher level player than Bam. I think most would agree on that. But again, AD's never played a level like that again, other than what he did against the Heat, where he's making every single mid-range shot. Uh, he's He hasn't done that since, actually. So I think when you look at it overall, you cannot make an argument, I mean, that anybody else has done more with less. I mean, Luka hasn't gone... I mean, Luka didn't make the playoffs this past year. They gave him Kyrie late in the season, but it didn't happen. And a lot of the other guys that get celebrated... Uh, have not done it. Now, Jokic is a little bit of a different example here. Um, they put a very good team around him. And Jamal Murray, in, in the bounce back from injury, uh, you know, played at a high level. And when you're talking about Michael Porter Jr. and Aaron G- Gordon, whatever order you want to pick is three and four. And some of the role guys they had on that team, that was an excellent team. And obviously the Heat ran into that. But I think that's where this comes from, because I think that there is this recognition that Jimmy has had to do more with less. There obviously was, you know, conversation when Jimmy came to the heat that they would find another star for him to play with. And now we're going all the way back to 2019. And that's, I mean, that's four years and it hasn't happened for a variety of reasons. Okay. There was sort of the run it back off season uh, that people talk about that, you know, where you, you slip in Mo Harkless uh, in that short <laughs> off season, none of that panned out. Um, they had, they gave Bam the extension early, which took, which they felt they had to do. It was the right decision. You take care of your guys. 
but they were kind of hoping, you know, maybe Giannis would slip through to them at that point. That was one of the things that took them out of the mix for that. And people have gone through the list. Now, not the list that the, those, you know, the ringer Celtics fans like Kevin O'Connor are putting out there where the Heat missed on Kyrie Irving. They had no interest in Kyrie Irving no. or Zach Levine or any of these guys. Ridiculous. Uh, ridiculous. Mitchell, there was the, the desire for Bam, who was not going to be sent for Mitchell the other way. James Harden would have been a disaster no matter when he was picked up. So, yeah, go ahead. The what the one thing I just want to mention as we go through like what has been brought in, I think it's very important to acknowledge, and this goes back to my point about not feeling sorry for Jimmy Butler. Um, I think that the that Jimmy, for as great as he's been, we need to acknowledge that him finding Miami has a great deal to do with the fact that he's had the ability to advance as far. I don't think he was less of a player when he was in any of those other places. So, one, we need to acknowledge that. And two, when the Heat did have the moment to pounce and have the flexibility to add a big contract and ch- of their choosing. And you can do that in many different ways, regardless of who's in the free agent market. They went for the guy that Jimmy Butler told them to go get. And we should also acknowledge that. And that's Kyle Lowry. Yes. All right. So let's, let's address that too, before we get into the window part, because that, that is the one thing that even those close to Jimmy will acknowledge. Kyle was the targeted free agent that off season. And it wasn't just the Heat that wanted him. New Orleans wanted him. Dallas wanted him. Philadelphia was in the mix until the last second. And so not only did the Heat go get the guy that Jimmy wanted to play with, but they gave him the third year, which is something that we're going to be talking about going forward because we're entering into that year. Whether Kyle finishes this year with Miami or not, it has to be said, and I think that any fair observer would say this, it has not lived up to expectations. I mean, we can get into the reasons why or not. They knew that the, by the third year, it would be problematic. They knew that when they signed him. I don't think they thought it would be so problematic in the first and second years, uh, particularly the second year. They were able to salvage some value with Kyle last year at the end because he did some good things in the playoffs and when he came back from that kind of brief sabbatical. But you cannot argue that a player who you, you're paying you know, roughly – $90 million or close to $90 million over three years in the second year of that contract from January 1st on would be averaging seven points, three rebounds and four assists on 31% shooting for three. And also, and Alex and I had this debate again last night, but is not a point of attack defender anymore. So you have to play de- defense differently when he's out there. That's not what they thought they were getting. And that is the player that Jimmy wanted. And so will you, I think I'm glad you brought that up at this point of the episode, because before we start to sort of assign blame, we have to acknowledge they went after the guy he wanted and it just hasn't worked out. And it hasn't worked out for a number of different reasons. But one of the things I think it's been particularly disappointing about it is the chemistry between Jimmy and Kyle never happened at, right from the beginning. And that was surprising to me. And I remember asking questions to both of them when Kyle came down and how easy that was going to be. And, uh, you know, especially with, you know, their experience playing together on the USA team. I, you never, I'm like, we've never talked about like, oh, Kyle and Jimmy look great out there together. No, like it, it's never been that. In fact, I think Kyle's had more of an influence in a positive way on BAM at times and certainly on the undrafted guys when he was running that unit than him and Jimmy. Like that two man game has never really been a thing. And I think that's why there is sort of this acknowledgement at this point that if, you know, Kyle ends up going somewhere else. It's not that Jimmy doesn't, isn't still his friend. He is, but that, okay, it's probably best for all parties if that actually occurs at this stage. So I'm glad you brought that up because there is a lot of blame assess. Well, they haven't helped Jimmy. No, in in a weak free agent market. Okay. They went and got a player at a position that they felt was a need because we knew Goran Dragic was declining and that player has not panned out. Just no other way to look at that. Um, so I, I'm glad you mentioned that. When we come back from the break, we're going to get into the actual question here in light of some of the things we're discussing, whether the window is closed. Um, because of things they've done in terms of Lowry or things they haven't done <laughs> in terms of Beal, Lillard, uh, et cetera, and let's not get into Durant because I, I they were always a long shot. It was kind of amazing that they were sort of second in that process. Before we do, though, I want to mention a couple of great sponsors of the Five Reasons Sports Network on Sunday, starting at about 1130 or 12 o'clock. Join us at Biscayne Bay uh, Brewing Company's Brew House. It's in downtown Miami. This is the only brew house in downtown Miami. 
It's like four blocks from Kasaya Center. Okay, they got parking all around it, including a lot real close to uh, to the facility. It is a great, great place. Okay, they've totally redone it. It's very classy. It's a great way to watch games. They've got a full food menu. Uh, it's going to be available all day on Sunday. And they've got obviously great beer. And if you mention five reasons, you get your first beer free. So come hang out with us. I might even buy the second round. Who knows? See, it depends on how I'm feeling. Uh, we're going to be out there with, with a whole bunch of people from our crew. And it's a huge game. Dolphins, Bills, obviously, for first place in the AFC East. Tua, Josh Allen, all that good stuff. they got foosball. They've got uh, video games. They've got pool table, and again, they've got food and beer and football. What else do you want? So check it out, Biscayne Bay Brewing Company, their brew house in downtown Miami. Also want to mention Better Edge. Before that game on Sunday, go on betteredge.com. Use the code 5RSN. That's the number 5RSN. And you will get $25, excuse me, $20 to play. And it's only $10 to enter our contest. So you can beat me. I'm the pacer this week. If you beat me, you win money. Go to betteredge.com. Use the code 5RSN. This is legal in the state of Florida and I think 43 other states. <laughs> That's kind of an inside joke here, but we'll, we'll get to more here in a second. All right, so let's get back to the poll. Do you think the championship window of the Jimmy Butler era entering year five has closed? Absolutely not. I mean, it, like the poll is so representative of our country. 50% of the people are wrong. Um, and uh sorry i had to sneak that in there um uh look y'all they were just in the finals and jimmy played out of his mind josh hart obviously injured him and he was a little bit hampered down the stretch so he was great but he wasn't like michael jordan great they got to the finals ultimately getting through boston and milwaukee i know milwaukee improved I know that there's a lot of stuff that they have to do here, and I'm going to talk about where I'm heading with this. But if we're just going to use data-driven decision-making here, you can't say that the title window is closed. We haven't seen this team play yet. They could come out, shoot 39.9% from three and lead the league this year and end up the two seed in the conference because of the shooting alone. And it may not, it may not lead to playoff success, but I'm just saying that there's too many variables to be like the title window is closed because ultimately, yes, they missed out on all these stars and everybody wants them to go get that top shelf player. Because when we watched them against Denver, it was clear that they needed one more guy. They were, um, as Nikias Duncan has said before, a creator short, but more than just a creator, like a Tyler Hero creator, Tyler the creator, haha. Um, more about like they needed elite scoring. They needed a guy who could get their own bucket and was proven to be able to do so late, right? But if Jimmy's getting you that close to the mountaintop, to me, it also signals that if you were to add the right pieces around the guys that you really feel good about on this roster as it exists today, you can make that run. There's no way that you can talk me out of the fact that if they were to take that bloated Kyle Lowry expiring contract and go to a team that's trying to cut salary and say, I'll take your $30 million player or combination of two players making 30, whatever million dollars. And those players can plug in as, as, as role players on this team, the way PJ Tucker came and made an absolute impact right off the bat. Um, we've seen other guys step in and figure it out quickly, but with actual um, talent that's proven, it's just crazy to me that people think that Jimmy wouldn't be able to, once he gets back into a seven game series where he can plot plan, strategize for these teams that he wouldn't be able to get surgical enough. And if he's healthy enough, get through, especially if everyone else is taking the requisite leaps that you expect 25 year olds and 23 year olds or 27 year olds to be taking in their careers like Bam and Tyler. So that's a very long way of saying, hell no, the window's not closed. We are approaching that type of conversation. If this season goes sideways and if they do not fortify the roster, there's no excuses. What are we holding the picks for? Are we holding the picks for Joel Embiid, who's not available right now? Are we holding the picks for like, there's no other star on the horizon here. Use one or two of them and let's surround these guys with maybe some B-level talent players, but some guys that really fortify this roster, give it the identity we want it to have, add the elements that they don't have, like 
shot creation, point of attack defense, maybe some rebounding in length. Go do that. And to me, there's absolutely no argument that you could say that Jimmy Butler can't get them to the finish line at least this season or next. Here's where I am on it. I'm a little less optimistic than you. I don't think the window is closed, but it's getting harder to kind of see through it because I don't know that they will do everything they have to do to give Jimmy that chance. And that's the issue. Yeah. And I don't know if they really believe that Jimmy is that guy to lead them there, even though he's proven it, because I think if they believed it, there would be more things that they would go ahead and do. And I come down, it's not about getting the whales. Okay. I that's, or the orcas or whatever, as you're talking about, it is about making the other moves and pushing that stuff in right now. Tax be damned. And this is kind of where I'm at with that. Okay. The Heat are not a cheap organization. I don't like that when it swirls around Twitter. It's out there clearly. I don't think that's the case. Bullshit. But they're not an all-in organization either. Fair. They're not the Golden State Warriors. They are not – it's not hell or high water. We're going to do this and this and this and this, and we'll pay the freight at the end of it. That's not them. They are somewhere a little closer to the middle, maybe towards sort of – the back of the the top ten, we talk about it. That's about where their payroll has been. Yeah, uh, it's sort of in that between eight, six and eight. Between six and eight, there thereby they you know they don't consider themselves to be a a big market team because it, by the metrics they're not. And this was a whole conversation during the lockouts and kind of where they fit and all that. It seems to me like where the Heat are is they want to leverage every advantage so they don't have to spend to the max. I don't blame them for that necessarily, but let me explain where I'm at with that, okay? When you have an elite coach and you can trust that coach to maximize players on your roster, you can pay that coach more to keep him without that affecting the luxury tax, without that affecting the second apron, without multipliers that you get into when you start talking about player salaries and the taxes and all that, without repeater tax issues. If you're going to spend the extra five, six, seven million, you spend it on the coach because the coach maximizes the players. And it's less punitive. And it's less punitive. You do what you can to keep an Adam Simon and Andy Ellisberg and Eric Spolstra because when they're the best at what they do, they can find you that player. They can develop that player, right? And they can also manipulate the salary cap and other things to keep you as far under as possible, okay, or not too far over so that you're not paying that much. And – Again, I understand that way of doing business when you can essentially exploit inefficiencies in the market, which is what they've tried to do with their developmental program. And they've been successful with that, particularly as they've learned the lesson of not overpaying those guys. Okay. Whether it was Struess or Vincent, we can talk about Vincent. It might be nice to have Gabe here now as everything worked out. Maybe if you'd offered him an extra 2 million a year from the very beginning and his agent hadn't gotten turned off because we knew what was happening behind the scenes there. Gabe might be here starting instead of on the bench with the Lakers because D'Angelo Russell and Austin Reeves were named the starters in the backcourt because I think Gabe wanted to be here. So, But overall, I agree with their philosophy of letting a guy walk as opposed to overpaying a player when they think they can create another one like that because they have done it, okay, repeatedly over the past few years. That's a market inefficiency that they are exploiting. In the same way as, again, if your coach can get the most out of these players, you pay him more instead of going deeper into the tax or things along those lines. But I I just – I don't know that they'll make the move that you're talking about. I don't know that Kyle Lowry's contract when Kyle is no longer a core contributor on this team, and it's just the reality. He's not – I mean, look, if he was anything close to what they thought he was going to be – we would not be saying they need a point guard. You're right. 
Like they, they're planning on bringing third. him off the bench for a reason. So you can spin it as positive because you can manage his minutes and, you know, he's been better in that role, but you you didn't expect to be in a position at this stage where we're not even saying he's an option to be your starting point guard when they don't even have another one. Correct. A $29.6 million backup. Right. So if you're really all in, then you're doing everything you can with that contract right now. And like you said, a first round pick to find a deal. Now, which one could you find? I don't know who's going to deal with you on the other side. We we talked about a bunch of deals. Could it be Lowry in a first for Heald and, and TJ McConnell? Could it be Lowry uh, and a first? And, and I'm not a huge fan, you know, and again, money's got to match. And there's other players that would be involved in some of these. That first one I think works, but the, these other ones, you know, if you're talking about Lowry in a first for Harden, not my favorite proposal but okay that's one that's been thrown out there or if you could deal with the fiend on the other side you know lowry and and two and two firsts for drew holiday or, or something along those lines okay and, and we just heard today that phoenix had interest in lowry's contract so that contract is going to have value around the nba i, I think if they're going to widen the 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 peephole in the window here okay mm-hmm. I'm with you. They need to do something like that because I like a lot of the pieces on this team, but they're at different stages of development. What Jovic is going to be in two, three, four years is not what he's going to be this year. I think he's got a bright future. We haven't seen Hawkins enough to know. Okay. Tyler, I think is going to take another step this year, but defensively he's always going to be challenged. It's just the way that it is. And Bam, I, I'm not going to count on a huge offensive outburst from him this year. I think we, I, I know you say no ceiling. I don't think we're at the ceiling, but, but again, I don't think there's that much airspace there either. Okay. On the offensive end, I think yeah. we kind of know what he's going to be in terms of his aggression. It's going to come and go. The defense is without parallel. Okay. And that's a great compliment to Jimmy, but they, they, they do need to add more. Mm-hmm. They, they do need to add more. I think to widen the window. And the other thing is this, okay? It's easy to say the window's closed because for the majority of of stars around the NBA, the window has closed, okay, or is closing. Like, it's not crazy to say that. It's the same way that Alonzo Mourning's window was closing even before he got sick in 2000. But so what did they do? Pat blew up the whole thing, right? And he went and got Brian Grant and Eddie Jones, and Anthony Mason, trading Mashburn, <laughs> trading P.J. Brown to widen the window, to expand the peephole there in the window, right? Or whatever we're going to call it. It's a door. I'm sorry. I'm all over the place with my analogies. But the point is, he did that. Zo got sick. Okay? We'll never know what that team would have looked like. But he was trying to give uh, Tim and, and Zo a better opportunity than they'd had with the previous team because it'd gotten a little bit stale. Now, Zoe won a championship, but obviously he won a championship as a backup. But I see Jimmy as much in the same place as Zoe was there. You know, he kept kind of beating his head against the wall. Now, for Zoe, it was earlier in the playoffs. It was first round. It was against the Knicks. If they could have gotten past the Knicks, I absolutely believe they would have made the finals one of those years. I think they certainly would have in 1999. Yeah. If they'd beaten the the Knicks, that's the year. They would have gotten to the finals. I thought they had their best overall playoff team at that stage, and that's the year, and that's why the Allen Houston shot hurt so much because you get to the finals, and I think they had a shot against the Spurs also. So it it just didn't happen, okay? Um, But with this particular group, I kind of – I kind of see Jimmy like Zoe in a lot of ways. And I mean, he carries more in the playoffs than Zoe did, but I it feels similar to me. I agree. Uh, and But they can change that. And that's the thing. Like, by what you said in terms of the way that they tried to rebuild around Zoe and Timmy, and they made that um, big trade. And, you know, it's funny. Like, before we even got to the Dame pursuits, and we were kind of like, we had an autopsy of last season and we talked about like, what do they really need? We really talked about that. Like ultimately they needed the James Posey, Antoine Walker, Jason Williams trade is kind of like where we landed. Right. And so I I guess I would just say this about where we're heading with this team and why I think it's so important that they actually don't um, clutch those draft picks because they think the next star is going to be available because guess what? 
we've we've they've already proven you don't have enough picks already and you're not going to trade a guy to get additional picks that's not what you do so like at that point it's a point of diminishing returns to hoard them yeah you're going to get more young players as you draft each of them but are they ready to contribute now so you look here and you have Kyle Lowry and Duncan Robinson they make a combined $47.8 million. That's roughly a quarter of the salary cap or total payroll for uh, the Heat. Round 187 is is the total payroll for Miami, I think, right now. 47.8 is roughly a quarter, that 25%, right? If a quarter of the roster is basically taken up by a guy who you hope bounces back, but for a lot of last year, he was quite frankly non-functional in Duncan Robinson and Kyle Lowry, who was flat out non-functional for most of the year. I just feel like you got to do something with that money because yes, this year they're at 187 million team payroll. This is per hoop type next year. Guess where they drop 152 million. Guess where they drop in 25, 26, 140 million. Guess where they drop in 26, 27, 33 million in committed team payroll. So you're seeing that number descending. And to me in the Jimmy Butler era, that can't happen. You better continue to spend money right now or else then it's clear that this is not the main thing is not the main thing. So we just need to stop saying that. The other part of this to consider too is, at some point, Jimmy is going to drop off. I mean, that that's I mean, that's probably where we should have started when we're talking about is the window closing, because typically with a 34 year old player, which is what Jimmy's going to be this year. That's the big question. Like, how long can he perform at this level? I mean, Dwayne Wade at age 34 was not performing at the level that Jimmy Butler is performing at at age 34, right? Where's Jimmy going to be at 35, 36? You know, the contract was something that you had to do. But when we talked about it at the time, we're like, okay, what is he going to look like at the end of this? Now that he looked at his absolute peak and at his absolute best in the playoffs until Josh Hart got his ankle, now we're kind of um, we're kind of assuming, I think, that as long as they manage him correctly, he plays 60 to 65 games. He doesn't care about postseason awards or any of that kind of stuff. So they'll manage him the way they feel they need to. Uh, but 60 to 65 games and then he's ready for the playoffs that he's going to be able to put you on your his back the way he has been. And that's a lot to ask. I mean, when he first came to Miami. I was always pushing back against this, but there was this premise that he wasn't going to be great late in his career because Tibbs ran him into the ground. Now I tried to make the counterpoint there that Jimmy hadn't had a lot of long playoff runs. He didn't play a ton early in his career, his rookie year. He didn't even start a game. So I was like, well, you look at his minutes compared to say LeBron's minutes at the same age or the same point. It wasn't even close because you got to take into account what LeBron played in the playoffs and all that. But at a certain point, though, there is where, and we have started to see some of it. The knee is a persistent problem, okay? It's not something that's going to be surgically repaired, but it swells. He has issues with it. We know that he had wrist issues, which obviously affected his three-point shot, whatever happened with the Philadelphia and the doctors and all that stuff, and and the ankles. Like, the ankles are constant. Like, he's always having ankle problems, um, and we saw that, that flare up again in the postseason. The fact that he doesn't like to talk about it or the fact that he guts his way through it, which is admirable, doesn't mean those things don't exist. And at a certain point, they pile up. And so the argument about, well, is Jimmy's window closed? And that's one of the reasons that I tend to say I'm closer to yes is because to say that the window is still open is to assume that he's going to be the guy that he's been in, you know, three of the last uh, four post seasons. And I can't guarantee that. I don't think anybody can guarantee that because you have younger fresher players coming into the NBA all the time who simply need the mental acumen to to match up to their physical stuff. Jimmy is at a absolute peak, an absolute peak level from a basketball IQ standpoint now. Right. But I think what LeBron is doing at age 40, okay, has, has twisted everybody's viewpoint on this because it's like, now it's this assumption that all guys are going to do that. Yeah. And, no. and LeBron is an absolute freak uh, in all these ways. Even when Michael came back, he was not the same guy when he came back with the wizards. And so at some point there is going to be a drop off. It's just, and but maybe not this coming season. Maybe, That's the one thing. 
maybe not maybe not okay that's that's very possible maybe you can stretch it a little bit but then that's the point though like for every every year that you're either waiting on the whale or don't trade the draft picks and whatever asset you do have to upgrade the roster you are tempting fate because at a certain point you're not going to have the same anchor for this and like i said unless you're assuming that bam is going to take this leap offensively no. which I think, again, is too much to ask of him with everything else that he's tasked with defensively and everything that they put on him, which is as much as any player in the league, frankly. OK, if you look at the two way uh, stuff that he has to do and unless you're expecting Tyler Hero not only to become a 23 to 25 point scorer, but to become a superstar. And that means doing it on both ends and all the rest of the stuff then you do need to get reinforcements because you cannot count on the number one guy to continue to play at this level forever. Um, And and I think that is something to consider here. And that is, and that's kind of the push pull of all this. Okay. As we get back to whether or not they're willing to be an all in team or not. Okay. Is that I, I I'm concerned about the justification of everything, because if you take everything that I just said, then you could say, okay, look, we may not have a real number one now. So this is not the time to pay the freight for all this stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. But you'd be ignoring the data that you do have. You'd be going off looks and feels. You would not be making a data driven decision. Okay. I mean, that's fair. That's fair. This is all I want to see at this point. Okay. They made an effort for Dame Lillard. I'm I'm not going to let anybody else argue differently. You can't we talked about the irrational actor on the other side. I don't again I was frustrated when it didn't happen at first, okay? Clearly if you listen to the first podcast that we did, then we got more of an autopsy of it, more of an understanding of it. I I still <laughs> think I still keep saying like you had to get this player, but now I'm like okay, I don't know how you would have gotten this player based on the circumstances and everything that else is coming out. So the idea that they didn't try to do anything this offseason is incorrect, okay? Just like it was incorrect last year about, well, they weren't doing anything because they let P.J. walk, when actually they did. They re-signed Caleb Martin to a very, very good contract, and he was nearly – he probably should have been Eastern Conference Finals MVP, okay? And, all right, so so there's a lot that, again, I think that they were – misevaluated by the public to a certain degree and paid the price for it in terms of what they did or tried to do in the off season or could have done last off season. And I think the same will be true of this off season. I'm not going to say that they're not trying to do everything, but I, I, I will agree with your premise here that you cannot, you cannot have a quarter of the roster or whatever it is where you're not getting like really strong performances from it. And if that means that you have to tie a future pick to give Jimmy a chance, I say you give Jimmy the chance now. Because I don't know where he's going to be in 12 months or 24 months. And there's not a long history of 35-year-old, 36-year-old players being the best player on a championship team. I mean, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you can watch Winning Time. I wish it was still on. Pat knows this was not the best player on the team by the end of that. Okay. He was the cap. Okay. But he wasn't the best player on the team. Okay. <laughs> you had two other hall of famers playing like in, the, Shaq in, in the starting lineup and Shaq with Dwayne. Okay. was not the best player on the team. I just, I don't, I, where is the example? Is it going to, is it Curry? I guess who's a totally different type of player than yeah. Jimmy who doesn't, doesn't, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, and again, Braun won in 2020 in the bubble. Cyborg. Vance age, right. Nobody can be compared to him. So I, I just think that what I hope is, as we close, I hope they don't take the perspective of it. Well, we can't win with Jimmy as a one because he's advancing in age, so we're not going to put all the resources behind this particular team. To me, it's the other way. Jimmy, after four years, regardless of whether he feels this way or not, whether it's more of a fan and media thing or not, Jimmy deserves the best possible opportunity that they can give him future be damned. That's that's where I'm at with it, okay? Yeah. That's where I'm at with it. And if you've got good young pieces, which it appears that they were willing to give up at least one of those young pieces in Jovic and Hakez and a potential trade, according to reports and stuff that we've heard, um, if that's what needs to be done, that's what needs to be done. 
And if it needs to be done that you attach a pick that could become a player like one of them to get off of Kyle Lowry's contract right now so you can bring in somebody who's going to help you in a more significant way, then that's what has to be done. I, I That's where I'm at with it. Just to sneak in here, I want to make sure everyone's clear. Kyle Lowry and Duncan Robinson account for about 25% of total payroll. It's more like 33% of the cap uh, if you're going by what the salary cap is. So like now you're talking over a third of your cap is under Duncan and Kyle. That has to be a functional player or two or three, please. Well, right now they're targeting those as they're basically their seventh and eighth men. Because I, I think you could say if Josh is starting and Love is starting, then Caleb is your sixth man based on the number of minutes he's going to get and the role that he's going to play. And then you're talking about, you know, Lowry as your backup point guard, but maybe closing some games and Duncan as your sort of designated shooter. And then you have your backup big, which is going to be Brian or Orlando Robinson. And then you have Hakez Jovic and Highsmith competing for that 10 spot. But you're right. 33% is a lot for your seventh and eighth players when we're talking about not even knowing what they're going to give you in those roles, you know, because there were a lot of encouraging things from Duncan in the, in the playoffs and particularly towards the finals. And I, let's be honest, he outplayed Max Drews, uh during a good portion of the playoffs. Okay. Is that going to carry over? Is his confidence going to stay at a certain level that has come and gone at times. And with Kyle, like, it seems like he can do it one out of every three games. And I, that's, you know, <laughs> that's, that, that's just not going to be enough uh, for this group. So I, I think where we, we kind of came to in this point, we were sort of all over the place in the episode a little bit, but I think as we're trying to work this out, it's this, they got to give Jimmy the best possible chance to win because it's going to get harder for Jimmy to win as he gets older. And, you know, that's that's just the nature of it. And so I, I, I think that's – is the window closed? No, because I'm not counting that guy out. Um, But, man, he's going to have to do some heavy lifting to be able to see through it. Thanks to our sponsors, Biscayne Bay Brewing, Better Edge, Prize Picks. Join us at the watch party on Sunday. Uh, we are going to get into a couple other things here as we go forward. Uh, one topic we're definitely going to do is what could raise the ceiling of this particular team. So uh, I've given Alex and Brady the weekend to ruminate on that. We'll get to that on Sunday night. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Five on the Floor on the Five Regional Sports Network.